been born again and baptized in the Spirit for about 12 years. The Lord in His mercy took me up out of, I could say the gutter, because that's where I was at. Uh, myself, I was at the mercy of a fifth of scotch a day. Yeah. And that's, if you ever been there, you know, it's just been recently when I think about that, it kind of chokes me up. But God was merciful, and the night we got saved, He totally delivered me from alcohol. As well as three packs of cigarettes a day. And at the same time, He delivered my wife from the same thing, three packs of cigarettes. We went into that meeting. It was the third time we'd been there. And that's the night we got saved. We got baptized in the Spirit the same night. We got delivered the same night. And the minister told us one thing when he got done praying for us. He said, resist the temptation. That's all he said. We knew nothing. Okay, we absolutely nothing. That's all he told us to do was resist the temptation. So on the way home, we looked at each other, and we had cigarettes still in the van. You know? We're looking at each other, and they're laying there. And he said, well, he said resist. He said, oh, we can do that. It's only a couple of miles home. So. We did that. We stopped at a friend's house and had a cup of coffee, and got back in the van and headed home and there they are again he says what do you think nah we'll wait well i'm here to tell you that by the time we got home we were free there was no urge there was no desire there was no craving nothing in fact our house stunk so bad when we walked in the door we thought something died <laughs> it was it was the worst smell I've ever smelled. In fact, probably for about four years afterwards, every time I'd go buy a vehicle, I'd smell the same smell, you know, if they smoked. I don't care if it was a truck driver or if it was a regular car. I don't think I'll ever forget that smell. But that's kind of what God brought us out of. I mean, the rest of the stuff's kind of typical for a sinner. But what I really want to tell you is what God's done since then. Because that's where my testimony is. It's not. He brought me out of some stuff, and that's God's glory. But the testimony is what He's done with me since then. And this is what I want to share with you because I want it to light a fire in you. Because we've been guilty as Christians for so many years of sitting and listening to testimonies like this. Sitting and listening to a preacher Sunday after Sunday. And that's all we've done with our lives as Christians. But I'm here to tell you that if you'll step out, God will use every one of you in a way that you never imagined that He would use you. About four years after we'd been saved, uh, some teaching on deliverance came into our church. And for some reason, we kind of jumped at it. We were one of the few couples that kind of was interested in it, so we just took, it by, took the bull by the horns and went at it. And God just began to open things up in our lives and, and made us sensitive to things. And we began praying for people, and God began moving. And using the Scriptures, He implanted in our hearts such a knowledge of His Word and the authority of the Scriptures that He took away all fear. And I can remember one of the first times we prayed for it was a sister. And we were praying for her, and I can't tell you what it was, but she died on us. She, just, she was gone. Breathing stopped, eyes rolled back, color changed. And I don't think we, this is probably the third or fourth person we ever prayed for. But the thing that I remember the most is there was no panic. The Holy Spirit brought to my heart that the Lord Jesus Christ is here. And He's life and life abundantly. So this thing can't stay. And that's exactly what we spoke out. And that thing lifted. That was our first understanding of the power of God working through a believer. Because normally, you know, panic, call 911. You don't know what else to do. But if you're a believer, the number you call, I think, is Jeremiah 33. Three. Yeah. You don't call 911. You don't need to. But you need to know your authority in Christ. Okay, you need to know who you are. And you need to know who the devil is. Amen. And you need to know that you fight for a position of victory. You're not fighting for the victory. You already got it. Amen. Amen. Because Christ gave it to us on the cross. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, it's ours. 
We just got to make sure the devil knows that it's ours. I talk to too many Christians, young and old, that don't really realize that the victory is theirs. They're out there fighting tooth and nail to get the victory. They don't have to do that. They've already got it. And it's hard. And sometimes we forget that because of the stuff we go through, the trials we go through. But the victory is yours. The devil tries to steal it. But we went through some... Uh, no physical trials, too, just like everybody does. One that comes to mind is uh, shortly, two years after we got saved. I'm a, by the way, I'm a, car, I'm a contractor by trade. I'm a carpenter. I'm Christian by profession, but a carpenter by trade. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we were putting on a roof on this house. And as I normally would do, I would walk back over the roof after we had it all, all the plywood nailed down to make sure we didn't miss anything. So I was there by myself that day, and I'm walking across the roof, checking it out. I go across the top edge of it and walk out to the, to the high peak, and I step down, and there was a half a sheet of plywood there that I had forgotten to nail. So I found myself in the air, um, maybe 17, 18 feet. When I landed, I landed on my side, didn't feel anything broken. So I got up, and as I got up, I felt that my one, I can't tell you which one now, one of my ankles was kind of sore. So I went back up on the roof and I finished out the day, about two more hours. By then it was all I could do to walk. And you got to remember, I don't know too much about, you know, believing God for some stuff. We're still kind of young, you know. And so we go home and we're supposed to go to a farm and pick up some fruit. So we went and it just so happened that it had to be, happened to be to some believer's house. So we were just loaded the stuff in the back of the van and I turned around and I just fell back into the van and passed out. I woke up, I got three people over me praying, laying hands on me. So, <laughs> so my wife drives me home, and uh, I tried to putz around the house, because I'm not one that likes to just sit and do nothing. I wasn't going to give way to, the, to what the devil was trying to do to me. So finally I went up, we lived in a two-story house at that time, and I hobbled up the stairs one step at a time. And when I got up the next morning, my confession first was that God was going to take care of it. That's all I knew to say. I mean, I saw in His Word that He's my healer, my provider, and that's... So this was a good test. So I got up in the morning and I told my wife, I said, I said you know, I know that if I can make it to the bottom of the stairs, when my foot hits the first floor, it's all over. I don't know why. That just what I had in my spirit. So I limped back down the stairs, and I'm here to tell you, when I put my foot on the floor, it was gone. It was instant. The swelling was down. The pain was gone. I went on to work. God will do that to all of us. Some things take a little longer. I'll share that in a little bit too. But God's willing to touch every one of you. Amen. Just that quick. He's not only willing, He's able. And on top of that, He's longing to touch your bodies. That's one of the reasons why Christ died on the cross. Not just for your sins. But our loving Heavenly Father cares about every need in your life. Your physical need, your spiritual need. He cares. And that's all in the atonement of our Lord Jesus Christ. He shed His blood for that. That you can walk in health. You can walk in provision. And you can walk in salvation, of course. Deliverance. Jesus came to set the captives free. Not just from the demonic realm, but from our own selves. Because you know, within ourselves we can do nothing. Amen. Amen. So as we as we moved along, and God uh, God had set us in a church that taught didn't preach, but they taught the word, in depth teaching, which really established a lot in our hearts. Mm -hmm. And one thing that uh, God impressed upon us in the very beginning was the idea that if you see something in my word and don't understand it, don't put it on the shelf. Take it and walk in what you can. And let me fill in the blanks as you walk. Because if we put it on the shelf, you know what happens. We get a shelf full of stuff that we never go back to. That's, our, that's human nature. That's what happens. But the Holy Spirit impressed on us, don't do that. If you see it in my word and you know it's there, walk in what you can and I'm going to fill in the blanks as you go. Which he's done that. And I'm, I praise the Lord that he established that in our lives early. 
So, um, the ministry of deliverance, counseling, laying hands on the sick, which actually that's one of my key scriptures is Mark 16. You all know that one. So I don't think I'm going to read it. But That particular group of scriptures tells every believer that you can lay hands on the sick, that you can cast out demons, that if you touch any deadly thing, it will not harm you. Not that we, we don't play with snakes. No. Right. So, like what happened to Paul. He got bit, but it didn't hurt him, did it? Okay. But if you believe the Scripture says, believe what? It's more than just believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You have to believe what He told you. And if you believe what He told you, then He says, when you're preaching the Word, He says, if you believe what I told you, then signs will follow what you say. I'll confirm my word. And that's for all of us. Not just for a few, not for just for the pastors. It's for the, it's for the whole church. Because that's what the Bible's written to. The Bible's written to every believer. It's not written to the pastors and to the teachers and to the evangelists. It's written to every Christian that walks the streets every day. God's given you an abundant wealth of knowledge to walk in victory. And He didn't give it to you or to me to hold it to ourselves. What do you say? Whatever you freely receive, freely give. And he's not just talking about money. He's talking about the Word and power that He has given to the church. So as we went along, another, another blessing is my wife and I, God has made a team. We work together. We pray together. We minister deliverance together. We minister healing together. That's just the way God's done it, and I'm blessed. God saved us both at the same time. And I, I know too many people that are split households. Husbands aren't manifested. Wives aren't manifested. And it's real tough. It's tough. But God is faithful even in those areas. So I'm just going to, basically I'm going to share what God's done with us. Now I've got some highlights at the end that uh, are awesome. But we, uh, we had a lady from a, another church come one time. And... Uh, she was an epileptic. Okay. But when she came, she walked in the door and she said, I know when I leave, I will be different than when I came. She came expecting God to touch her. And what she came for was that the medication she was taking had destroyed her liver. She was faced with surgery because the medication had wiped it out. And she says, I want God to renew my liver. That's what I'm here for. So, that's what she wants. That's what we ask the Lord for. That's what we pray for. She left. She called us back, I think, two or three days later. And she'd gone through the test, and the doctor had told her that her liver was like a newborn baby. You know, and that's awesome. But we're nobody. Okay, and this is, that's the point I'm trying to get across to you. We're nobody. One brother said we're like a rubber hose. <coughs> We're nothing until the Holy Spirit pumps something through. Amen. And that's true. But see, we're guilty of saying, well, I can't do anything. Like the brother shared in the beginning, you know, if you got a little finger. But it's not us anyway. If you're willing to put your foot in the door, God's going to open the door for you. It's His grace anyway. It's His anointing on your life, not yours, not mine. So anyway, two weeks later, I think, she came back, and this time she wanted to deal with the epilepsy. Same thing. She came knowing that God was going to touch her. So who are we? I mean, we pray. She leaves. Next time we see her, about two weeks later, three weeks later, we met her in a grocery store. We asked her, well, how's things going? She said, I haven't had any problems ever since. We got delivered. And so this kind of sparked us. You know, we're seeing what God wants to do with His people. He wants to use them. He wants to put them out in the field. And so there were many cases like this. And finally, uh, one of the highlights was in 1993, we'd gone to Texas. And a little bit into Mexico with some friends or missionaries down there. And uh, God even opened up more. But one thing we saw then was that the people that we would minister to were coming out of the churches. 
And I didn't think a whole lot about it at the time. It just seemed a little strange that they'd be coming to an outside source for help. Because most of these people were coming out of Pentecostal churches. Spirit-filled churches. So the Lord blessed us while we were down there uh, in 93. Then he opened the doors in the summer of 93 to go to Russia. So we went with the group and we established a church in a town called New Sherbakseri. A town of about 150,000 people. Uh, the crusade was about a week. We saw, I think, about 3,500 people. Come to the Lord. And again, God moved. There were prayer lines at the meetings. There was 22 of us from America. We each had interpreters. So each one of us had a prayer line at the end. And people would come. You'd pray for them and God would touch them. It was awesome. You know, one teenage girl, uh, she came and through the interpreter said that both her ears were infected. She was in intense pain in both ears. She couldn't hear. So we put our hands on her ears and didn't even get the prayer halfway done. And she's up around my neck. I mean, there's tears coming down her eyes. I mean, God hit her. And it was awesome. And I began to realize then that this is what God wants. Mm -hmm. You know, this is where it's at. It's not in the church. Not knocking church. We need that. But the power of God manifested is not, doesn't belong in the church. It belongs in the street, okay? It belongs where it's needed. Amen. You know, we've become so used to going to church and seeing somebody fall out in the Spirit or God touch them that it's almost commonplace now. And we wonder, God, it's getting dull. There's nothing happening. There's nothing happening because the church isn't where it's going to happen. The ministry of Jesus and the disciples was outside. Amen. It was in settings like this. You know, meetings, house meetings, uh, grocery stores. How many of you in a grocery store setting have run across a friend that had a headache and volunteered to pray for him there in a grocery store? Some of you have, I know, but how many? You know, everybody should have their hand up in the air. Okay? That's why church is getting dull. Because we're expecting others to be doing what they're supposed to be doing. So, we went to Russia. We got blessed. It was life-changing. The only problem was we came back to this country and it's like a dud. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to hear what you got to say. We think. Mm -hmm. That's the way it appears. Over there, they pull it out of you. Mm -hmm. We had tracks and uh, I had them in this pocket, I had them in my pants pocket in the back. <laughs> Ran out here and they're tapping me on the, on the behind one, knowing that I got more back there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a little strange, but they're very warm people over there. We're going to go back this summer, Lord willing, um, for a church strengthening crusade. But in the last few months, um, God has given us a twofold burden. One is for the lost and dying. The other is for the church. We're seeing so much hurt in the church. So many people are holding within themselves hurts and wounds and scars. Yeah. Not only through the church, but from the past. And the church is not ministering to those needs. And God has pretty much told us that He wants to begin to minister to those needs. Because a hurting church can't minister to a hurting world. No. It's impossible. Because you can't relate. I mean, you're hurting inside. How in the world can you minister in love and compassion to somebody who's hurting just like you are? Mm -hmm. So, that's what God's doing with us. He's opening some doors where we can speak like this, share testimony, but also share the burden. And I believe He's given us an, an anointing to deal with the hurts in the church. And it's not going to be just us, okay? It's going to be anybody willing. Anybody willing. We just happen to be willing right now. And another thing, we just came back from Texas last Sunday. And the anointing that God allowed us to experience down there was probably ten times greater than we'd ever experienced. We, he used us more. He worked through us more. It was 
Other than awesome, I can't tell you. But it's only because we went and we were willing to be used. Because we're nobody. Some of you have probably been saved longer than I have. It makes no difference how long you're saved. If you're willing for God to use you, He'll use you mightily. So all it takes is a willing heart. You know, He's going to clean your life up. Yes, He is. You know, I've talked to people that said, well, I've got this problem, I, you know, I'm working through this, and, you know, I really don't think God can use me. Listen, God will use you where you're at, and He'll clean up the rest Amen. as you go. Right. Scripture Amen. says that pray one for another that you may be healed. Amen. So, don't let that stop you. Don't let the fact that, well, I don't know as much as so-and-so, or don't let it stop you. God will use you. Just present yourself to Him and say, God, I want you to use me. I want to see Mark 16 fulfilled in my life. I want to lay hands on the sick. Yes. I want to cast out demons. I want to see souls saved. All you have to do is ask Him. And He'll begin to make a way, maybe not within your own church, maybe just outside and people you come in contact with. But I honestly believe it's going to start within your church. God is going to open up doorways for you within your church to begin to minister. So while we're in Texas, the uh, the Lord provided maybe, I don't know, 10 or 11 people that we were able to pray for. Some came out of the alcohol. Some were just battling emotional turmoil inside. But again, everyone came out of Pentecostal churches. Some have been there for 10 years. And the churches tell them, well, you're saved. Just God will take care of it. Which is true. I mean, God will take care of it, but the Scriptures give us guidelines to go by to help one another. Amen. That's right. You know, it's up to God to do the work, but it's up to us to help one That's another. Right. The Scripture says, bear the strong to bear the infirmities of the weak. Right. That doesn't mean just to put up with them. Mm -hmm. And to tolerate them, that means help them. Mm -hmm. Counsel them, pray with them. If there's a spiritual problem, uh, as far as uh, demonic, Deal with it. Amen. You've got the authority. Luke 10, 19 says. Amen. You've got all the power over all the power of the enemy. Thank you. And nothing's going to hurt you. Mm -hmm. If you're under the authority that you know you're supposed to be under. Amen. You don't want to do that blatantly. I'm not afraid of the devil. Okay? I'm cautious. And I know he's subtle. So I'm aware, but I'm not afraid. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Is all the power I need. And I'm preserved. I'm protected by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. And so are you. But the church, and I asked the Lord if I could say this, so I'm going to say it. The church is failing her people. They're teaching the Word, but they're not teaching how to live it. They're not teaching their people how to use the power of the Scriptures in their lives to set themselves free and set those around them free. And I don't mean that every group is the same way, but the, I'm talking the church in this country is failing its people. And God's going to change that. He's going to pick up individuals in different groups and He's going to start giving them that burden to get their church out of this thing to where they can be an influence in their community. They can be powerful again. Like the New Testament churches were. Um... Again, we you know, dealt with a lot of occult things. There was uh, a lot of actually religious spirits also involved. But the high point was last Saturday. I'll back up. Friday, I, I spoke at a full gospel businessman's in El Paso, by the way, too. That was kind of a surprise. I didn't know I was going to do that. So they got this first. <laughs> Some of them. Uh, Saturday, we... Uh, it was our last day, and we were been believing the Lord for the opportunity to minister to a young man that we had met two years ago when we were down there. He uh, was a new Christian at the time, on fire. I mean, God had so anointed him with the Spirit that you'd look at him, and he just, he was gone. In church, he couldn't stay stood up. It was just, he was that sensitive, and God just was, but he made a mistake. And the devil came in with some condemnation and he just kind of walked away from it all for a while. But one of the things he shared with us was this. 
He said, you know, in my zeal, I looked around me and I, all these Christians and I couldn't understand why they couldn't stand in the trials. He said, and I said, I'll never fall. You know, I'm going to stand. Oh, well, we know what the Word says about that. Take heed lest you fall. <laughs> well, so he fell and he wound up into uh, cocaine. He'd been snorting cocaine since September? Well, about nine months. Hmm. And he wouldn't talk to any of the people that he used to know. They'd call, leave messages on the machine, he wouldn't respond. And so we were believing the Lord to be able to meet with him somehow, at least tell him we loved him and that we're not going to let him go. And that's really all we had in mind in our hearts. And so it came Saturday and he still hadn't come and he promised he would come. So I told one of the sisters that knew him, I said, look, when you see him, tell him we love him and we miss, miss seeing him. So she said she would. Well, what she went and did is when she left, she went and called him and told him. So he got to the, the apartment at 6 o'clock that night. And from that point on until about 10 o'clock, it was just a bunch of tears and hugs. And after about an hour, he was sitting on the couch and, you know, the typical excuse is why he did what he did and all this. But then he got real quiet and he said, you know, I'm going to tell you something that I haven't told anybody. And he said, he said this, he said, the center of my nose is gone. It's burned out inside from snorting coke. And God used that to break him. I mean, he just opened light up. And so we started to pray. And really weren't doing anything other than praying for him because we didn't want to push anything on him. And he tried to ask the Lord to forgive him. He tried. You could hear the words, but he couldn't get them out. He just couldn't get him out. He felt really bad. And so we just prayed. Finally, he stood up and he had his hands in the air. And we kept praying. He kept trying to ask the Lord, you know, I want to change. I want out of this. And they just wouldn't come. And then God touched him. He was on the, Then he was on his face. And we could hear it. He asked. He was able to get the words out that he wanted to change. Amen. And from that point out, it was kind of downhill because... We, there was some major deliverance, some spirits of cocaine and addiction and all that that came out. And his confession when he left the place was this. He said, I'm back to stay. And he didn't say that in a proud way. But he, he was back to stay. Now he still needs your prayers. He's got a lot of, a lot of walking to do. Okay? Now, his name's Chip. And if the Lord brings him to your mind, he's about 27 years old, I think. Loves the Lord. God never left him to himself totally. He was always there poking at him. And he knew at some point in time he was going to come back. But God was blessed. God appointed this time so we could be a part of it. And it, it really encouraged my heart. But it also made the burden heavier as far as the lost and the dying, but also the church. I see it in our church. I see it in different Christians that we talk to. We had a house meeting last night even, and there was probably a dozen women maybe, and two guys. And God did the same thing there. I mean, He, he wants His people free from the in, internal turmoil so we can be effective for the kingdom. I, I wish that I could look at you and just say, you know, that... God's going to do it tonight and it's going to be gone and you can go on. But you have to want it. One of the biggest things that God did in the last three weeks for us is He baptized us in compassion down there that we never had yeah. in Texas. Yeah. I mean, heartfelt compassion. Not the kind that you see a sad thing and you, you, you weep. This came from inside. Yeah. And that's what the church needs. The church needs a baptism in compassion that's heartfelt. Not just being sorry for the state of somebody's life or that they're going to go to hell, but compassion that will motivate them to do what Jesus did. Yeah. Scripture says He was moved with compassion. He touched lives because He cared. So, I don't know where any of you are at at that point. But one thing God did, again, 
is he baptized people, I, I'm using that word a little loose, but he baptized people in his unconditional love. Everyone we prayed for in the last two weeks, he touched with his unconditional love. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know where you're at with God's unconditional love. But he loves us unconditionally right where we're at. Yeah. He doesn't intend to leave us there. Okay. Praise God for that. Amen. But he does love us unconditionally. We can't earn it. Any we can't lose it, we can't earn it as long as we're walking with him. But he's not going to leave us where he found us. So we can't rest in that unconditional love and say, Whew, I'm okay. You can't do that. So don't do that. But I would like to ask you, in fact, I'll pray for you, either corporately like this or individually if you want, um, for God to give you a revelation in your heart of His unconditional love for you. Amen. Because there are some of you, I think more sisters than guys, but there are some of you that have got things buried so deep inside. Mm. And you won't let them go. Because you're afraid that if you expose those things, if you bring them to light, God's not going to let them go. I've got news for you. He wants those things out. So you know how much He loves you. And He's going to do it one way or the other. He's going to do it tonight or He's going to do it some other time. But I just, I, I want you to, to get that in your heart because God loves you. Where are you at right now? He's not going to leave you there. But He wants you to know that He loves you unconditionally. You can't earn it. You can't do things better. You can't pray more. You can't fast more to change the way He loves you. Some of you can't relate to that because of how you were brought up. The type of parents you have perhaps. Fathers, whatever. You don't know what that's like. And that's hindering what you can receive from your Heavenly Father. And only God knows. You and God know what's going on inside right now. And I believe the Lord's touching some, some things in some of your hearts. And He'll bring it to, to fruition either t tonight or later on in the week. But He's going to do it. If you let Him. So that's what God's doing with us. He took us from fifth of scotch a day to an overflowing spirit with a different kind. Over. And every one of you, if you're willing, can do that. Nothing's stopping you but yourself. God says, my grace is there. My Spirit's there. You're baptized in my Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit are there. He's given us the command to go. The longer you sit and wait in the church, the more you're going to be disappointed. The church is supposed to be a filling station. Right? You get filled up and you go out and you give it away so you got room for more. Amen. So, I'll share one more thing and then I want to pray for some people if they want it. Just yesterday, the Lord gave me a, a, a mental picture of a 30-year-old brand new car. Brand spanking new. Never even been started. It was bought, put in a garage, and put under wraps. Now, you all know what happens to a car when it's put in storage. Mm -hmm. I don't care how new it is. The seals in the motor go kaput. Mm -hmm. They dry up. They shrivel. The tires rot. Mm -hmm. The body begins to rust. Mm -hmm. And he likened that to the church and all the power that he's given to the church. Mm -hmm. We've taken, we put it in a garage, and we put a cover on it, and we expect it to stay intact. Mm -hmm. But it's not going to. And it hasn't. Right. It's caused bitterness. It's mm -hmm. caused division That's right. in the church. Yes. We can't fellowship one with another in Jesus Christ because it's sat there and it's rotting, folks. And God's not going to have it that way any longer. Amen. You. And you can be a part of it. You can be a part of the change. You can determine in your heart tonight to change that. And you, if no other thing in your own life, that you're not going to be responsible for what He's given you just sitting there being dormant and rotting in your life. Well, thank you for the opportunity to bear my heart. And, uh, I can't, I, I don't know what else to tell you, except that I love you. And I want for you what God did for me. Okay? 
Not everybody's going to have the aptitude or the feeling to do what we do, per se. But everybody can do what God's called them to do. Yeah. And that's, that's what I'm asking you to do. Now, if there's anybody, my brother I think was talking about, the Holy Spirit touched him. If he would like some prayer. Oh, I do. I need to know what's going on. <laughs> I won't mess it up. Like I say. Well, what a delightful message. You've been listening to a gentleman by the name of Mark Jones sharing how God has worked in his life and what God has been doing in his life. I do hope that some of the things that he has shared, has ministered, uh, imparted some insight, something special to you. Maybe you just uh, tuned in uh, in the last few moments. Uh, what you are watching is Precious Testimonies. And we have been videotaping um, the message of Mark Jones. He was guest speaker at the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship Outreach. The uh, location uh, where we filmed that was at the Rock Island Restaurant on M40, just out of uh, Holland. And I'll give you some information if you would like to attend one of those Saturday night get-togethers. Uh, they have a great time. If you've never been to a full gospel uh, businessman's um, get-together, it's just a fantastic way to come into an informal setting where people have a bite to eat and laugh and enjoy themselves and have someone like uh, Mark come and just simply share and minister as he feels led to do and uh, that's something that is available to the public. Uh, you get something to write with, and I'm going to give you some information about how you can attend one of those just in case you might want to. Uh, also, I'd like to give you some information on how you might want to contact uh, Mark. Perhaps you'd like to uh, get in contact with something uh, he has said has blessed you and you would like to ask us some more questions or Maybe you would like to have Mark come and minister in your church or in your fellowship, whatever that might be. We want to make it easy for people to get a hold of Mark. Uh, so you might want to get something to write with, and I'll get that information to you in just a couple of minutes. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, it's not all that important, but I'm Norm Rasmussen, the host of Precious Testimonies. Uh, uh, I'm the guy who usually does the videotaping of uh, this ministry, and my wife helps me out a lot with that. But basically all uh, we are called to do is have people uh, share their testimonies. Uh, we set the camera up, we film it, and uh, put these out on public access and let God use them as he would do so. It's an exciting opportunity to be used of God to help people realize that God is real, that God is alive, and this one called Jesus Christ is far more than what so many people realize he's all about. The cross of Jesus, there is more knowledge, more insight to be gained about the cross of Jesus Christ than what many people realize. And I've done some praying about how God would take this broadcast from from here, where he'd want it to go, and and I do believe he's imparted some things to me. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take a giant step of faith and share some of my own testimony. Take a segment right out of my life story and and, and share that and let the Holy Spirit impart what he wants to impart. Uh, to whoever would be watching this uh, video, this broadcast, or listening to the uh, cassette tape that, that would get played, uh, get made and into people's hands. Uh, before I move into to, uh, that portion of my uh, story, um, let me give you this information if you've got something to write with now. Uh, Mark Jones was the speaker, and he can be contacted. I'll give you his home number, area code 616. 468-7266, area code 616, 
866. Feel free to call him if you would like to uh, talk with him about God, if you feel that he's someone that might be able to help you somehow, some way, receive some freedom in some areas of difficulty that you're encountering. Uh, he avails himself to be used of God, however God would want to use him. Uh, also, I'll give you his address in case you might want to write him or uh, to know where he lives. He lives in Coloma, Michigan, and the address is 6615 Brundon Place, and I'll spell that, 6615 Brundon Place, B-R-U-N-D-E-N Place, P-L-A-C-E, of course. Coloma, C-O-L-O-M-A, Michigan, 49038. And uh, he currently attends Faithful Word Fellowship uh, over on East Center there in Coloma. Uh, address is 6545 East Center. So if you'd like to uh, show up on a Sunday and talk to him there at a local church, uh, we uh, uh, encourage you to do that too. Uh, maybe you don't have a local church in the uh, Coloma, uh, Southern Michigan area. Uh, Faithful Word Fellowship might be just the place that God would have you uh, be a part of so that you can get rooted and grounded in God's Word and be nurtured up and equipped to get out there on the front line for God helping people just like Mark is, whether it be in Russia or right down in the Coloma, uh, St. Joe Water Valide area. Makes no difference. There's hurting people everywhere. And then we're going to share a little bit more about the full gospel outreach. We'll give you a phone number and uh, more pertinent information on that at the end of this broadcast. So uh, keep your hand, uh, your, your ink pen paper handy, and we want to share a little more about that later on. But right now, I, I want to move forward in some things that God has done. You know, Mark, as he was sharing about unconditional love, it brought back a time in my life. I've, I've been a born-again Christian now a little over 15 years as of this taping. For the first 35 years, I didn't even believe there was a God. I was agnostic, involved deeply in sin. I was going to commit suicide, sick and tired of living. I figured I was not going to live the second 35 years of my life as miserable as the first 35 was. So uh, I was going to commit suicide, and God, uh, in His grace, reached down and kept me from doing that and in the process uh, Jesus Christ became real to me and and I made a commitment that I would follow him and give my life to him as best as I was able the rest of my life but I'd need a lot of help to do that and and I still need a lot of help to do that but that's why the Holy Spirit's been given to help me be um, what God wants me to be and with that, I was, I'd been a Christian about maybe three years. Uh, I'd considered myself a believer on Jesus Christ for my ticket into heaven when I died, uh, believing on Jesus Christ to baptize me, immerse me, fill me, uh, smother me, call it what you want, with the Holy Spirit. Uh, I, I wanted all of God I could get, and I still want all of God I can get. Uh, but there was a time at the workplace where the Holy Spirit began to do something with me. I, again, I was about three years a Christian believer, and uh, I was involved in, in, in some ministry. We were writing testimonials back then, or had started writing testimonials on paper and putting those out for people to read in restaurants and into prisons and laundromats and different places uh, where we could put those. And uh, um, God began to work inside of me on the workplace. And I found myself, uh, the job that I was doing then, still doing now, I drove a lot in a company vehicle, and I found that I could not concentrate on my work, but that this overwhelming desire to praise God, commune with God, was, was bubbling up inside of me, and I found myself just singing praises to God, very unlike anything I'd ever known before. Um, 
And, it, and I was just talking to God. I said, God, I just love you, and I just thank you for sparing my life. I just thank you for giving me some purpose and meaning in my life. Thank you for opening up the Word of God to where the Bible is starting to uh, make some sense to me, and I can understand it, whereas I couldn't before I became born again. Uh, so many things to be thankful for, but it didn't even stop there. Every song... Uh, that I had learned every Christian song that that was uh, meaningful to me I was singing that to God and I was singing a new song and I found myself doing that all day long well the next day it intensified and then the following day if I remember correctly it intensified more to where I finally I couldn't even sleep at night all I wanted to do was just commune and worship and fellowship with God I'd never experienced that before and this was it was consuming me I wasn't forced to do it, but I, I had a longing, a drawing to want to do this. And and I just had a sense of knowing that I was going to have to take a couple of vacation days, at least one or two. I was going to have to get away from work, and I was going to have to get away from the responsibilities, the normal routine of life. Had to get alone with God where there would be no distractions and let this hunger and this thirst take its course wherever it was to take me so that... I could uh, be, uh, I don't know, it, it was, it's so difficult for me to describe now, and it was every bit as difficult to describe then. All I know is I wanted to love on God and never quit loving on God. I, I just didn't want to do anything else but just love on God. And so I took the day off. I told my wife, Kathleen, that, that I, God was doing something in me, and I didn't understand what it was, but he knew and that I needed to get alone with God, and she, she understood that. There's times in each of our lives where the Holy Spirit will draw us, and he wants to take us aside where he can do special works in us. And because I had never had that happen quite that way, it was, it was new to me, but I knew it was right, and I knew it was God. So uh, I took the day off, got a vacation day from work, and hopped in my car and wanted to get out alone and really didn't want to spend a lot of time driving. I just wanted to shut that car off and spend time loving on God. Now, maybe many of you watching this right now may not understand what that is. That may sound crazy. It may sound really fruity to you. But when God becomes as real to you as God became real to me, see, when I talk to Jesus... I knew he was sitting right there. I mean, he was in my heart, but he was like my best friend. That's how real he made himself to me when God became real to me. There was no doubt when I spoke to God after he became real uh, that he heard me. Okay, and, and not that I deserve that, and you're going to find that out shortly. I didn't deserve that. I was no one special at all. God just evidently uh, had compassion and mercy to say I'm going to invest some grace in this guy rather than let him go to hell which is where he was <laughs> headed so drive the car out shut it off I, I really call this testimony love on a dusty road this is one chapter out of my life of 15 years now um I call this chapter Love on a Dusty Road because the theme is going to be on unconditional love. Mark shared some things about unconditional love, and that's what this story is about, love on the dusty road. So I took that car out on a little two-track uh, dusty road, shut it off, and just begin to... Let it all go. I let it all go. And I, oh, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I praise you. Oh, Father, I adore you. Holy Spirit, I thank you so much for being inside of me. Thank you for, for uh, you know, not giving up on me. And sure, there was a lot of sin in my life. I wasn't totally obedient to everything God wanted me to do. And I'm still not. But I don't get hung up on that. I know because of what I'm about to tell you, God gave me a revelation of some things that I just believe is going to uh, set some of you free. It's going to set some of you free watching this. That's what it's designed to do. Not to tell you, look what God has done in my life. Well, look at that. No, I, I'm no one special. I'm the least of the people that will make it to heaven. I know that I'm a sinner saved only by grace. I deserved to go to hell and be in hell. Yet, 
God reached down, stopped it, and now I want to give the rest of my life to God. I figure that's the least that I can do with the rest of my time here on planet Earth. Help his cause somehow, some way. I was living on God in that car. Well, after an hour maybe, I lost track of time. My knees were getting cramped and I realized I had to get out of that car. Uh, it was a smaller car and, and so I got out of the car and, and there was no one out there around and it was a bright, beautiful blue sky overhead. It was a spring day, I believe, about 70 degrees, no humidity. One of those picture perfect spring days, early summer days. And I just stood out there on that dusty road and I lifted my hands to God and something that I had not done a whole lot at that time. I was kind of embarrassed to do that in public. You know how that is. And, and I was just, oh God, I love you and I praise you and I exalt you. And, and, and that was not something I had to do. It was like something was just compelling me to do that. So difficult to describe. But Anyway, I did that, I would say maybe an hour. I, I lost track of time, maybe two hours. Uh, and I was, I, I was content to do that for hours and days and weeks and months. It's like I didn't want to do anything different than that. And that was so new. I, I'd never experienced anything like that being a Christian before. Although I hadn't been a Christian long, but like I say, two, three years. So... I'm loving on God, just telling him how much I love him and appreciating him and thanking him. And, and all of a sudden, after a great deal of time had gone by, suddenly that whole desire to praise God just shut right down. Just like something instantly shut it off. And everything got quiet. Everything got quiet inside of me. And, the, and God spoke to me. I'm assuming it was the person of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I don't know that it was audible. It doesn't matter. He just spoke loudly to my mind, to my being. I heard his voice very clearly because it was such a change of gears. I mean, we're going down the road at 90 miles an hour and suddenly the Holy Ghost slams his thing in reverse. Okay, and it's like, bam, I mean, I'm going instantly 90 miles in reverse without hearing a changing of grinding of gears or anything. We just, we went past neutral and instantly hit reverse, so to speak, the dramatic change here in, in God changing gears. And God spoke to me and he says, Norm, you're trying to earn my love. You cannot earn earn my love. No one can earn my love. It's totally impossible to earn my love. My love is totally unconditional, no strings attached, totally unconditional. Well, I begin to weep like a baby. I mean, I began to boss. I said, God, I didn't know that. You know, I just spoke it right out. I, I believe I spoke it right out. I said, God, I didn't know that. And he says, I know you didn't know that. And that's why I have been preparing you. And that's why I've got you in the spirit so much. Got you away from the thoughts and cares of the world. Got you so in tune with the Holy Spirit. So that you could hear clearly what I've just told you and I'm about to tell you. And so obviously, I, I, I got my antennas up and I wanted to hear everything. It wasn't difficult to hear. He had my attention. And he says, Norm, you need to understand something about me, okay, and this unconditional love. He says, Norm, see, you've been doing ministry. See, I was writing uh, the testimonials. We were doing some things in the local church. Uh, wanted to be used in ministry. But God says, you're doing ministry to try to earn my love. That's the wrong motive. He said, Norm, you're reading the Bible because you're trying to earn my love. Well, that's the wrong motive. You're praying to me because you're trying to earn my love. Wrong reason. Okay. You're giving money to my work. You're giving time. You're giving effort to the cause of Jesus Christ, to the gospel, to the kingdom of God. 
for the wrong reasons. You're trying to earn my love. Now, I understood that I can't earn my salvation. See, I got that revelation. There's nothing I can do to earn my way to heaven, to earn my right in receiving the free gift of eternal salvation. I knew that. So I knew I was not deceived into trying to earn my salvation. But if you knew my home life, like many of yours, like many, many people, you're so beat up, you're so abused that all you know is that you have to do something to get somebody's love. We live in a, in a race. We live down here on planet Earth with people who put conditions on love. Okay? And so we're so conditioned to performing to get somebody's love. Well, God says, you can't earn my love, Norm, and that's what you've been doing. And I said, well, Lord, I didn't know that. He says, no, I know you didn't know that. That's why I'm now telling you. And I said, well, Lord, you know, there was this, this well, I, I, how can I understand this and get this? I need this, you know. And he says, Norm, you must understand this. I love the worst of sinners to the greatest of saints equally the same. Okay? He says, I mean, to the worst of sinners you can think of. Let's take Hitler, for example. Many of us know Hitler. Many of us understand the history that he was responsible for killing the multitudes of Jews. Okay? We understand that. God spoke to me at that time and he says, Norm, I love Hitler, even though he's probably in hell. He didn't tell me he was in hell. I just assume he's in hell. God didn't say. Okay? But I love Hitler as much as I love Billy Graham or the Pope or whoever we might think is one of the greatest uh, Christians doing the most for God that we can imagine. He says, I love sinner and saint equally the same. I don't love Billy Graham one percentage factor more than I would love Hitler or, say, Jeffrey Dahmers or somebody that we think God couldn't possibly love because of some of the things they've done. Okay. This blew me away. Still blows me away. I said, God, how can you do that? I mean, that's the next question. I'm standing there. I said, God, how can you love the worst of sinners, the most ungodly, the most brutal hatred people? To the, How can you love every human being that ever has been born or ever will be born equally the same? How can you do that? And he said, because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Because of what was accomplished by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He says, Norm, when I see people from the foundation, even before Christ was ever crucified, I saw the sacrifice of my son Jesus. Now, this is God the Father speaking, okay? Uh, to my mind at that point, we have to separate God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Father was the person imparting this revelation to me on the dusty road. Okay, keep this thing in context. He was saying, Norm, from the foundation of the world, I knew my son was going to have to die for the sins of humanity. I knew that. Okay, And because of that, that was my plan from the foundation of the creation of the human race that would fall into sin. He never wanted it to, but he knew it would happen. His plan was executed in his mind. And as soon as he executed the plan in his mind, he could love the worst of sinners to this most saintly of saints, equally the same, because of what would be accomplished in the future by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay? The atonement, as Mark spoke of, the atonement, the sacrifice of God himself. Because you see, Jesus Christ, although he never sinned, 
He was all man, but he was also all of God. So God himself was the sacrifice. He had to sacrifice himself to be the only suitable substitute for the sins of humanity. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that issue because there's many other things to say about this unconditional love issue. So I said, okay, I received that, God. I don't understand it. But through Christ, you can unconditionally love the worst of sinners to the saintliest of saints. Okay. Then God said to me, but you must remember, Norm, I hate sin with a perfect hatred, but I love sinners unconditionally. Let me say that again. The sin that I do, he hates with a perfect hatred. He hates the sin that I do. But he loves me unconditionally in spite of the sin that I have operating in my life. He loves you unconditionally. It's, it's totally impossible for him to love you and accept you any less than he accepts me or Brother Mark or anybody else, okay? He accepts you just the way you are with a comma, all right? I'm going to come back to that comma because there's some other things I have to say to that to give you the full gospel here, the full counsel of the truth that you need to hear before this broadcast ends. Don't matter what sins you have done in the past, don't, know, don't matter what sins you're doing now, it doesn't matter what sins you're going to be doing in the future, God will love you unconditionally every bit as much. Hypothetically, you can go out and murder 100 people in cold blood. God will love you unconditionally every bit as much as if you never murdered anybody. Okay? He hates the fact that you're murdering people. But he loves you unconditionally because of the death of Jesus Christ, burial, resurrection, the atonement of Jesus Christ on that cross. That's what God told me. That's what I believe he told me. Okay? I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. You're going to have to choose whether you believe that that's what he said to me or not. Okay, I'm not here to try to convince anybody that just because God did an experience in me, God said it. But I will trust the Holy Spirit to impart to those who can receive the truth of what he showed me. Okay, so it can be imparted to you. Well, I was taken back. I, so, you know, I'm saying, God, you mean... Now, now this, this, this is really going to rock the boat of some people. This is really going to curl the hair on some people's head, what I'm about to say. This will curl the hair on a lot of Bible teachers, pastors, people, okay, that um, are teaching others, all right? I said to God, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm getting all I can get out of God at this point, because I never heard ever any of the things that the Holy Spirit was teaching me at this point. I'm saying, God, are you saying that if I never pray to you, you will love me every bit as much? I mean, he didn't even pause. He didn't even stammer, stutter. He didn't even take a break. He said, that's right. I said, you mean if I don't even read the Bible ever again the rest of my life, you will love me every bit as much? He said, that's right. I said, you, if I don't ever go to church, you love me every bit as much? That's right. Now I really thought, ah, here's the ultimate question. Now that I got a hotline to God. I mean, I got a hotline, I'm going to ask this. Because surely he's going to tell me no on this. I said, God, if I don't ever give any money to the work of the Lord, will you love me every bit as much as the same? He said, yep. Didn't even pause on that one. I says, God, is there anything that I can do that will stop you from loving me unconditionally? He said, nothing, Norm. Nothing. You can't earn my love. 
I don't care what you can ask me. There's nothing you can do to stop me from loving you totally, unconditionally. Okay? I says, wow, God, that's almost unbelievable. You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's some of the truth you needed to know, Norm. Well, I went down to my knees. I began to bawl like a little baby. I mean, that was my next. I just, I was broken. I mean, I was just broken. I, I said, God, because it suddenly became so clear. I was fasting. I was fasting regularly. I was fasting once a week. I thought that was making me more, you know, uh, i get more. See, I didn't realize that I was trying to earn God's love. I didn't, I thought it was God's blessings and favor, but it, it, it was not. It was not. God, was, God said to me, you're trying to earn my love, and you can't do it. It's a free gift. It's a free gift, and it was accomplished because of what God purposed to accomplish in totality by the death of himself, the death of Jesus Christ on that cross from the foundation of the world. Okay? And so then when I thought God was done with me, then he said, <laughs> now you got to understand some things and this is the comma th that I told you I'd get to he says now if you think that this is a liberty to go out and sin and ride on my grace to ride on my forgiveness to ride on my mercy uh, Norm you're, 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 you're making a sad mistake in assuming or, or presuming that because there are consequences to sin Okay, what you sow, you will reap. You, under, you need to understand that the law of sowing and reaping must not be confused with unconditional love. He says, for instance, Hitler. He says, I love Hitler unconditionally, but do you think he's in hell? I said, I got to believe he's in hell, God, unless he made a last second confession that you honored before he died. And, and the understanding is God loves every individual who has ever gone to hell. He loves them unconditionally. But he doesn't like the sin that sent them to hell. Okay, He doesn't like uh, the, uh, the rebelliousness in them. Does that mean that the devil will not go into everlasting punishment, everlasting torment? No. God said it's going to happen. So love only goes so far here. I mean, God is going to execute his wrath. He's going to execute his judgment on the devil and his angels. That's been decreed. Love has nothing to do with it because there's a wrath side of God as well. See, there's a love side of God, and we're focusing in on the unconditional love side of God. And there's a purpose for that because many of you out there are caught in the snares of this issue of love, okay, and the devil is able to mess with many of you, was able to mess with me, and I'm going to get into some other areas that, uh, but I just want to say that in the issue of sowing and reaping, well, let's get back to the story here. God said to me in terms of finances, okay, Norm, keep this in mind, my spiritual law of sowing and reaping is such, if you don't give money to the work of my uh, kingdom, to the cause of the gospel, to the cause of Jesus Christ, and helping the, the, excuse me, the gospel going across the land, when you get to heaven, don't be surprised when you don't get a whole lot of rewards. Okay? Because what you sow, you will reap. What you withhold... You won't have, okay? Fine if you don't ever want to read the Bible, Norm, but when your spirit dries up and your mind is all messed up by the devil, don't be whining and crying. I mean, the Word of God was given to us to, uh, to well, it was given for a lot of different reasons, but if I was going to write on the fact that I never had to read God's Word, ever read the Bible, it would be stupid. Same thing about church. Fine if you never go to church, Another day in your life, Norm, 
But when you're all messed up and the devil has eaten your lunch alive, don't be sitting back whining and crying wondering what happened. See, so, so then I began to say, well, God, then what's the balance here? And it was, it was, I, I, it, it was, see, under the Old Covenant, the Old Testament Covenant, people were motivated by fear. People were motivated by, if you're obedient, I will bless you. If you're not obedient, curse will come upon you. Well, once the new covenant was put into effect, after Jesus died on that cross and he rose after three days, the new covenant was put into effect. The, the giving of the Holy Spirit, the new covenant was put into effect. And when the new covenant was put into effect, the totality of God's unconditional love, the revelation of that, the impartation of that to the body of Christ, to humanity, was imparted in a much fuller measure, as I understand that, okay? And so grace then took over, see? Being right with God now did a flip-flop, and it came from trusting in Christ, all right? It came from trusting in Christ. It came from trusting in this one, the Messiah. And so what that translated down to me is the new covenant, new covenant is not I have to, but I get to. The new covenant is I get to. It's opportunity. Okay? I get to. That's the best way uh, I know how to describe uh, the new covenant. I'm sure there are many other ways to say that, but but I just want to say something else that ties in with um, a few of the things that I said. See, God accepts us just the way we are. Doesn't accept the sin in our lives. Expects us to go to Him and ask forgiveness. The Word of God says that when we recognize sin asking for forgiveness of that sin, the forgiveness is instantaneous, all right? But then he expects us to say, God, now I need help in getting this sin out of my life, okay? That is all part of dealing with God. It's important to know that. So God does accept us just the way we are. But... And here's the comma and the but. But he desires that we let the Holy Spirit make us into what Jesus is. He accepts us the way we are, but he desires that we let the Holy Spirit make us into what Jesus is. Okay? That's what we need to know. Each of us. Now, who is Jesus? What is Jesus? Well, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of understanding. I don't want to bombard you with, with everything at one time. But, but if we turn to the book of Galatians, chapter 5, um, verse 22, um, the fruit of the Spirit is this. The fruit of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Spirit fruit of the Spirit of God is this. These are the primary qualities of Jesus Christ. And so um, what God desires for us to do is work in cooperation with Him to let the Holy Spirit make us have the qualities of God Himself. All right? And what are those qualities? What are the most important qualities? Well, chapter 5, book of Galatians, Starting with verse 22, it reads, But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Love is the first quality that, is, that, that we're to let God build in us. And I'm going to share a little bit about what that love is. Okay, Joy. We're to have joy. God's will is that we have joy in the midst of our miserable circumstances. Bad and good times. It's His will for us to have joy. Jesus knew how to get joy and hold on to it. Peace. Peace with God at all times. Patience. Patience with God. Patience with ourselves. Patience with others. Kindness. Kindness toward God, ourselves, and others. Goodness. Faithfulness. Faithfulness to God. Faithfulness to humanity. Faithfulness um, to everything that breathes. Gentleness. Self-control. Okay? 
These are uh, the characteristics of Jesus Christ. The first one is love. <clears throat> I'm going to read out of the um, NIV translation because it helps. Uh, there are many translations that you'll want to look up in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, but, but what is love? What is love? What is love? Some of the most important things that God wants us to understand about love is that, first of all, love is patient. Okay? We're to be patient with God, patient with ourselves, patient with others. That's one of the most Christ-like qualities that we are to allow the Holy Spirit grow in us. So love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. Love's not rude. It's not self-seeking. Me, I, and my. Bert, me, change my diapers, feed me. I don't care about whether you have to lose sleep at 3 o'clock in the morning and get up and rock me, okay? It's just like a little baby. We're to grow up. We're to grow up. Love is not easily angered. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love always protects. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. Love always perseveres. Now, if you have some trouble with uh, the NIV translation, you can look up uh, in your King James or many of the other popular modern-day translations of the Bible, and they will give you uh, a little bit of different wording there. But the Holy Spirit will impart to you the qualities of love. See, that's an expansion of what God wants us to understand about unconditional love. Having said that, now we enter into another realm that I feel is important to mention. See, the devil does not want us to understand first and foremost that God loves each of us totally unconditionally. God is the only one who has the ability to accept me just the way I am, but hate my sin. He, 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 the only way he can tolerate my sin is looking at my sin through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. There's nothing else he can stand about me, I'm convinced. Nothing else God can stand that when he looks at me other than he's got to see me through Christ. It's the only way he can keep himself from blotting me out like stepping on an ant on a sidewalk. Okay? Because of his love that was proven by the death of of his son, Jesus. Okay, let's look at how the devil wants us to be confused and blinded about this issue of love. See, love today says, I get to. The devil has implemented several things into humanity, several things into the body of Christ, into Christianity, into the, to, into the church. And number one, it's called legalism. Legalism. The devil's nuclear warhead, so to speak, against people functioning in atmosphere of love is legalism. All right? Legalism says, I have to. Love says, I get to. Love says, I get to. Legalism says, I have to. Okay? There are many, many people teaching in our uh, church circles, they've got legalism confused with God's love. All right, and, and, and God, is, um, God is not pleased with teachers of the Word of God who is implementing legalism into the midst of those who are trying to learn everything they can about God and pass that on to others who have questions about God. See, see um, the, issue, uh, <clears throat> the issue of... Uh, Legalism says, well, I have to give money to the work of the Lord. 
See, and they'll start pulling scriptures out of the Old Testament to support, um, uh, you know, their position on that. And, 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 and the new covenant, uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit says, no, I, I don't have to give one dime to work a ministry. But I do it because it's an opportunity. I get to give to the work of the ministry. Why? Well, first of all, because I know that if I don't sow, I'm not going to reap. Uh, secondly, uh, I'd be a fool not to give to the work of God. Okay? I'd just be an absolute fool. Now, I don't have to go on any guilt trip by percentages. I don't have to do that. And uh, But we have many people that get the feeling like, well, if, you know, all they really want here is my money, you know, and, and, and I'm going to get on that issue. I'm going to get on this issue because I think it needs to be addressed. Um, you go out into the highways and the byways to people who aren't going to church, and you ask them, why don't you go to church? Most of them will give you one of two reasons. Okay? They will say, well, all the church wants is your money. Or they'll say, well, the church is full of hypocrites. All right? Well, I'd like to address those two issues. They'll give you some other reasons. But those are the two most common reasons that I've heard uh, people who aren't going to church. Uh, many people who confess themselves to be uh, believing on Jesus Christ for their eternal salvation. I've heard it said that 9 out of 10 people who call themselves Christian believers aren't even going to a local church in America. Now, I've asked um, people what they think about that, and you get all kinds of mixed opinions on that issue. I have some opinions of my own, but I'm not going to express them at this time. But I want to say one thing. I believe the devil, being the accuser of the brethren, speaks through well-meaning peop well people, and they say, well, all the church wants is your money. Devil has to have some platform because he can, before he can convince some people there's some truth to this issue. And I just want to share, maybe you're a pastor right now watching this. Uh, maybe you're an elder or a deacon, someone in church authority that has influence over money. You know, one of the things that I just, I just really believe would bless God uh, to the depths of his being is that we would remove the money motive in Christianity. Remove the money motive. Just remove it. I mean, when you come into a church, let the pastor announce, hey, if you think we're after your money, please don't give. If the offering plate goes by, please don't give. That doesn't affect God's unconditional love for you. Okay? If you think we're after your money, please do not give. I mean, if that's something the, the devil is using to keep people out of church, remove, take, 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 the, take the enemy, take the, take the weapon right out of the enemy. Remove that because it's true. It's either true or it's not true. I mean, either God accepts me if I don't give any money, or if I give a million dollars, it don't matter. If that's true, what I told you, God showed me and didn't, did, okay? It's not a matter whether I'm accepted or not accepted. It's a matter of sowing and raping. All right? Give a little. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, now I maybe ought to read that a little bit for some of you, I'm assuming you're Bible students, but you may not be. You know, the last thing that was really said uh, that you can drive a nail in uh, Paul says it's acceptable for what you have, not what you don't have. So let's turn to, uh, you know, we get, we get all wound up about got to give 10% of your finances. We start picking and choosing out of the old covenant, and we start putting, we, we start putting people under the legal bondage that the enemy puts people under. And they're so confused, and there's so many people that aren't responding to God because they get to, and it's an opportunity, but they feel like, if I don't do this, um, uh, something's, something, God's going to get me, he's going to wang me over the head, he's going to let the devourer eat me, uh, all kinds of stuff, and, and, and people are functioning in fear. God never intended the new covenant to have a place for fear to motivate us. We're to do it because it's opportunity, because 
because because God accepts us unconditionally, isn't it the least we can do to give everything, our time, our energy, our resources, our finances, into the work of God, expecting nothing back to? If he expects us, gives it to us unconditionally, can't we give it back to him unconditionally? I mean, that ought to be the first response when we get this revelation of God's unconditional love for us. Okay? Um, in the second book of Corinthians, chapter 8, um, one of the key revelations that a lot of people need to get a hold of, I personally think, is verse 12. It's acceptable to what a man has, not according to what he doesn't have. So, if people are putting a guilt trip on you, okay, about giving time, talent, treasure, any of that, and, and you're not measuring up to what they think you ought to be measuring up to, hey, pray for them, forgive them, love them, but don't take that junk. Don't let the devil beat you up through them. But this sowing and reaping, uh, uh, the spiritual law goes into chapter 9, uh, starting with verse 6 in 2 Corinthians. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully uh, shall also reap bountifully. Let each one do as he purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. So, so really, uh, you know, love has nothing to do with it. It's just, you give, you're just going to somehow give back. Uh, not necessarily in this lifetime, although God has the option of doing that. Okay, not going to get into that. Not going to get into the, to the prosperity gospel. Could go off on that one for a long time. Let's get back to the point at hand. Thank you for being patient with me. I hope somehow, some way, you're being set free from this. See, you've heard God is love. Well, Satan confuses love by interjecting legalism into Christianity. And, and although many Bible teachers don't know they're doing this, okay, um, it's happening. And, and you feel like, I have to do this and I have to do that. If I don't, I'm not going to be accepted. I'm not going to be made to feel uh, as normal as anybody else. And, and the devil is a master at, at doing that through legalism. Legalism says, I have to. Love says, I get to. God does not love sin, but he loves a sinner. Okay? It's important to know that. And just some notes I took down here. Um, see, the favor of God also must be taken into account. Uh, God many times will withhold his favor from us if we don't have sin out of our life. We have to have right motives. We have to be lined up with some of the principles and truths of God's word before he will grant us favor. See, that has nothing to do with unconditional love. But God will withhold his favor or increase his favor depending upon how obedient you are because Jesus did say also, you love me, keep my commandments. Well, the proof of your love to God is that you say you love me, well, we'll see, keep my commandments. See, Jesus wasn't impressed. He didn't take a whole lot of time to give anybody a great uh, teaching about his unconditional love. He just, he come right out and said, you love me, keep my commandments. You know, that's basically how it goes between parents and children right now. You know, you tell your kid to do something if you're a parent and the kid doesn't do it. Uh, love goes down the tube real quick, doesn't it? I mean, like, you want my favor and blessing? Do what I'm telling you to do. You want to be uh, chastised? You want to you, you want to lose favor? You want to be uh, punished? <laughs> Disobey me. Well, I love you equally the same, whether I'm paddling your little bottom or making you sit in the corner, Johnny. I mean, I'm doing this for your own good. Love has nothing to do with it. In fact, I love you so much, I'm going to just try to uh, squeeze that rebellion right out of you. That's how much I love you. So, so see, you, you don't want to get too ooey-gooey with this unconditional love. All right? There's a different side of God, and that's called his... his, his uh, his wisdom, okay? God, knowing what each of us needs, uh, deals with us in ways that we don't always like simply because he's so wise that he knows what we need. Well, we as parents, 
um, pretty much know what's best for each of our kids. We know God gives us the ability to know right and wrong what's good for our kids. We're not all messed up on dope and alcohol and all goofed up, but if we've let the Holy Spirit come in and heal us and deliver us and teach us some things so that we're you know, reasonably balanced, we, we know right from wrong. We know what's best for our kids. We know what's going to cause them to self-destruct and end up in prison and, and on drugs and in gangs and all that stuff. We know. Uh, kids don't always listen to us, but we know. We know a lot more than what they think we know, all right? And so we're going to do whatever we think is best to help them avoid the mistakes we've made to keep from going headlong into more trouble. Well, God does the same with each of us, whether we're 90 years old or nine months old, okay? He's looking out for our welfare. But he loves us so much that he will allow us to go our own way and make, uh, he'll allow us to go right to hell. He loves us so much. If we demand our right to go to hell, he loves us so much that he'll give us that right. Okay? That's how far his love goes. Now, I want to say something for those of you out there. If you think you don't have to invite Jesus Christ into your heart, if you think you're going to get to heaven without trusting in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, if you think you don't need the Holy Spirit to make you Christ-like, if you don't think you need the Holy Spirit to show you God's plan, God's purpose, God's will in your life, God's Spirit to empower you, to help you become an effective witness, to empower you to go forth doing what God's called you to do, if you think just riding on God's unconditional love is going to get you to heaven, you're sadly mistaken. See, because God is, he's the perfect God of love, but he's a perfect God of wrath as well. He's a perfect God of holiness. But God's wrath, God says in his word that his wrath is already upon every person that comes into this world. The moment you are born, God's wrath side God's wrath has been executed upon you and his judgment has said you're going to hell when you die if you don't accept the provision that I made for you on the cross, my son dying for you. Now, obviously, there's exceptions to that. Obviously, you can't take a, a two-month-old baby that dies... Uh, that baby's not accountable. So God has built into uh, humanity uh, certain exceptions that we don't have a lot of understanding of, okay? But I know no two-month-old baby is going to be listening to what I'm saying right now. If you've got this far and you've rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ, which is you can't earn your salvation. It's free gift. You can't earn God's love. It's free gift, Okay? The only way you can receive it is by trusting for it. Saying, I take it, God. Free gift. I take it. I want it all. I receive it. See, if you reject that, then God's wrath is on you, which means his judgment has already been pronounced. And so the judgment will send you out of the presence of God for eternity and you will go to hell, be separated from God's family and God himself and God's holy angels for all time and eternity. That's what the Bible says. If the Bible says it, who am I, okay, to say God doesn't know what he's talking about? I certainly can't prove that's not so. I can say, well, I don't believe that. Yeah, <laughs> I can say, well, I believe it. You can't prove you're right. I can't prove I'm right. I'd rather be in God's presence, okay? <laughs> I'm going to do everything I do can do, in other words, to make sure that if God says it, I'm going to agree with it. Because for 35 years, I tried to say it's a bunch of nonsense. It's a bunch of Huey, a bunch of baloney, okay? And I was ready to blow my brains out, and uh, <laughs> so to speak. And I'm so glad that now I can say, God, I agree. I mean, I don't fully understand it. I'm not God, you are. And a lot of things I was not made to understand. We're not going to understand them, the Bible says, until we get in the presence of God. But I've said a lot of things and gone around here in a lot of circles. I'm just 
trust in the Holy Spirit to impart some things, folks. And I want to get back to some of these issues of legalism. You know, let's describe legalism. Legalism seeps into Christianity. It says, well, you must wear your dresses such and such length. Well, you can't have long hair. Well, you can't have short hair. Well, you can't do this. And you have to do that. It's making people conform to what we think are our standards. And if you read the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll see that legalism had penetrated the religious people of the, that day. It was the religious people who hung God on the cross, killed him, and stoned. It was always the religious people. <laughs> the religious people. And how did the devil get his snare in them and control it? Well, it was through legalism. Okay, if you don't do what I'm doing, if you don't do what I'm doing, because what I'm doing, I believe God wants me to do, then something's wrong with you. And if I say, well, I don't agree with that, then you're ready to kill me. You're ready to say, well, I'm a heretic. Well, I'm full of the devil, right? Okay, let's hang this guy. See, that's what legalism will do. That's what legalism will do. And that's the, that's the door in which the devil operates. See, that's why Jesus says, don't judge. Okay, judging is saying that, judging is saying, well, I'm God, and if you don't do what I do, if you don't believe what I believe, then there's something wrong with you. I don't think I like you. I don't think I want to be around you. I don't even think you're a Christian. You know, it, it can go that far. I mean, we can, and, and, and that's what the devil is a master at because it pits one against the other. It divides us. It, it, it causes the, the backbiting, the spiritual cancer that operates in Christianity. And the devil knows that as long as we're divided, the power is removed. The power is removed. Unconditional love says, I lovingly disagree with you, my brother or my sister in Christ. See, we don't have to agree doctrinally on every little thing. We never will. You can't get two Republicans to sit down if they'll be honest and say, well, we agree on this is how the nation ought to be run. You can't get two Democrats. You will never get two Democrats if they'll be honest sitting down and say, well, I agree with this, I agree with this. You're going to have them disagreeing. Yet for the sake of the party, the Democrats will hang together. So will the Republicans for the sake of the party. Well, why can't we Christians see if the politicians are smart enough to do this? Why can't we do this? But no, we're going to fight and squabble and let the devil divide us which what happens? Removes the power of God. We got no power. All we got is theology. We got no power. We're denying the power that God wants to bring into the body of Christ. Which brings me down to something else that Mark said. He just hinted on it, but it's something that runs very deep. And I'm going to let it out. See, I truly believe James 5.14. God says, Anybody sick, let him call for the elders of the church, anoint them with oil, prayer, faith, heal the sick, save the sick. If they've confessed any sins, let them confess them and they'll uh, uh, be forgiven. Okay, there's much to be said about that issue. But I truly believe the Holy Spirit has imparted some things to me. I believe God is looking for some team people in the body of Christ. I believe God is looking for some uh, team elders, so to speak. Trusted people who are mature in the body of Christ who will avail themselves to be team members to become a team. We got a team of, instead of just a handful of elders in a local church that God will bring citywide elders together. We'll have some Baptists. We'll have some Pentecostals. We'll have some Lutherans. We'll have some Reformed. We'll have some Catholics. We'll have some of this. We'll have all of these denominational folks, undenominational folks, throw them all together, get some people who will come together in unconditional love, submitting one to another, okay? Be willing to take the power of God to the highways and the byways, Okay. We have so many hurting people, Mark said, in the body of Christ. I believe partly why that is is because we are not telling people to get out of the church 
and get out there into the highways and byways and, and minister to people right where they're at. We don't have to condemn them and send them to hell because they aren't believing like I'm believing. Reach out in compassion and mercy and minister to their need. And they might want what you got once they see the power of God released in their situation. Okay, And I believe God truly wants to minister wholeness, spiritual, emotional, and yes, even physical wholeness. But it ain't going to happen with people saying, well, if you want that, you come to my church. Okay, You want to get healed, you come to my church, and that's it. Well, if you don't come, something's wrong with you, you don't need heal, go to hell if you want, I don't care. There's people who's got that attitude in the body of Christ. Hey, I'm... Okay, I'm hearing the Holy Spirit saying he's looking for some people willing to get out of the four little square walls of the local church. Praise God. As Brother Mark said that's a place to get filled with the Spirit, get charged, get taught. Yeah, we've got to have some place to get discipled. But let's not just camp there. Let's not camp in the local church. Let's get out and take what we got to a hurting and dying world. Let's take it out and beat the crap out of the devil. See, Jesus said, I came to destroy the works of darkness. Now I die, give you my spirit, give you my word. Now you go out there and kick the crap out of the devil and his demons. Get out there and do that. So God's looking for a team of people, quote, elders, people who can be trusted to hear what God is saying so that they're willing to go to bat, willing to go to war against the plan of the enemy in the lives of people and in situations. God's looking for teams of people coming together in the body of Christ irrespective of doctrinal differences coming together because they're each believing in Jesus Christ coming together in unconditional love, okay? Putting everything else aside, forgetting this my little empire, my little church, my little pastor, my little group of people, well, if you don't come to this, you don't belong, you know, it's like, man, let's quit putting this thing down into me, I, and my, and let's see it as a body of Christ as God sees it. We are one family down here, but we don't act like it. Okay? The truth is, we don't act like we're one family. Well, the Baptists are one. Well, the Pentecostals are the deceived. Are, well, the Catholics, they're, we're either one family or we're not. There's only two groups of people down here on planet Earth according to God's Word. Those who are going to make it to heaven, those who are going to make it to hell. Not a third group of people that's going to stay here on planet Earth forever and not have to go to heaven and not have to go to hell. We're all going to die. Some's going to heaven, some's going to hell. All right? Let's establish the criteria for who's going to get there and who isn't. The Bible says it's pretty clear. All right? You'll know them by their fruits. All right? Fruits. What kind of fruits? Well, stay away from them Baptists. Stay away from them cats. Stay away from them... Man, that's a bunch of baby junk given to us. If you confess Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you understand that he was all of man, all of man, but all of God, you can't earn your salvation, free gift, that's what I'm believing on, then you're my brother, you're my sister. I don't care what you call yourself. I don't care what you believe about healing, don't believe about healing, tongues, no tongue, baptism, Holy Spirit, not get it all, don't get it all, get filled, it don't matter to me. I love you unconditionally because God loves me unconditionally. Now, if he loves me unconditionally, who am I to not love you unconditionally, regardless of any differences in our theology, other than what I just mentioned, okay? So let's get together and work as a team. Now, why in the world would God want to bring a citywide team of elders together for a common cause? To be used to hear the Holy Spirit to go to war, battle against the forces of darkness in the lives of hurting people. All right? That way, there's unity. That way, no local church gets the glory. No one pastor, no offense if you're a pastor listening, no one group of local elders in one local church, but the glory goes to, first of all, it's supposed to go to God. But it has to then go to 
the body of Christ, the citywide body of Christ, not to a handful of one or two people. Look at my anointing. Praise God. God can do whatever he wants to one individual. But I'm hearing the Holy Spirit say, let's look at it as a team. Let's get a team together. If you think you've ever seen power, you haven't seen anything till I can get a group of people in a given city, a citywide team of elders working together, people that can get together Submitting themselves one to another, forgetting the tangents, okay, forgetting the, the pendulum that swings too far left or right, and just simply, let me say something, folks, about issues of suffering and sickness and disease. If God is doing something in someone's life, there's nothing a team of elders or you or any human being can do if God is doing something in somebody's life. All right, whatever that might be, if God's doing it, you are not going to bind God. You're not going to cast out God. None of your prayers will ever stop God from doing what he purposes to do in somebody's life or in a situation. But if it's the devil doing it, then God expects Christians to work in cooperation with God to stop the plans of the enemy in, in an individual's life or in a corporate setting or whatever. See, God is looking for people who can know the difference between what God's doing and what the devil's doing and say, okay, God, how do you want to use me if, the, if I discern the devil's doing this? How can I know how to work in cooperation with you and the other brothers and sisters you give me to destroy the works of darkness in this situation? That's what I believe God's looking for. And so I want to encourage you, uh, people like Brother Mark, there's many people out there that are getting from the Holy Spirit, get out. Take the power of God out on the workplace, in the marketplace, wherever you are. Quit putting people on a guilt trip. Go in unconditional love, showing them the, the unconditional love that God has given you. Hey, it's the Holy Spirit's job to work in the lives of people. All right? All he wants us to do is plant in water and release his unconditional love. Because when we release his unconditional love, Brother Mark said something else. We got theology. You know, if we believe in healing, praise God. We don't believe in healing, praise God. We, we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Praise God for that. That's biblical. He's so right. We need the baptism of compassion. When we have the... That's not necessarily scriptural, but there's so much wisdom in what he just said. The baptism of compassion will get you when you're hurting where other people hurt. You're more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. You'll hear a lot more easily when God will tell you, back off that situation. You know, this is one of these, uh, w w what the devil means for evil, I'm going to turn for good, or, or this is whatever, whatever, okay? Um, I don't have the maturity to know exactly how all of these things work. What I do know is that God is looking for people who wants to hear what he has to say, and then I'll do something about it. But it takes compassion. It takes compassion to hear the Holy Spirit. If I don't have any compassion, if I don't care that people are hurting, well, as long as I'm not hurting, that's somebody else's problem. No, we need the compassion, which is compassion sensitizes us to the voice of the Holy Spirit so we can hear how to effectively be intercessors, intermediaries, intermediaries if you will, to destroy the works of darkness. God could not have proven his love in any greater way than what he did by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to that cross some 2,000 years ago to die for humanity. That is the proof of God's love. That is the ultimate proof. Jesus Christ never deserved to take all of God's wrath upon himself. See, God's wrath was executed upon his son Jesus. God's wrath actually was executed upon himself. Okay? That's why God will allow you to go to hell if you reject the good news of the gospel, the plan of salvation. You see, 
God's wrath did not stop. God's wrath will never be executed upon those who receive the plan of salvation because it was already executed on Jesus on the cross. But for those of you who do not appropriate that salvation, trusting in Jesus Christ for your eternal salvation, your eternal forgiveness, your eternal joy in heaven, those of you who reject that, okay, God's wrath will be upon you. The Word of God says it's already on you. But you'll see the totality of that on the judgment day when you will be sent to hell to the degree of punishment that God the Father determines that will be executed upon you. Okay? So you need to know that. I just want to thank you uh, for letting me share that with you. I'm going to give you a little bit of information here now uh, about the Full Gospel Businessmen's Association. Um, Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship meets in the Holland area um, every month uh, on a Saturday evening. I believe they meet uh, the second Saturday of every month. Uh, there's a couple of phone numbers here you can call. Uh, I'll give you the name of the president and the vice president. You can call their home number and, and find out all the particulars if you would like. Um, the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship has uh, been an outreach where they have people come in and testify and, and uh, just uh, try to be used of the Holy Spirit to minister to the people there. And, and it's in an informal setting. It's just a great uh, opportunity uh, for um, uh, you to hear testimonies such as the one that Mark uh, just uh, 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 gave earlier in this broadcast. So if you have something to write with the president uh, of the uh, Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship at the current time is a Hugo Stahl, and his home phone number is area code 616-772-6702. Uh, the vice president is Roy Harrington, area code 616-751-5262. You can call either one of those numbers and find out what Saturday night of the month they meet and, and you can put a reservation. They eat a meal at 6 o'clock and then the person is going to be testifying, will begin testifying at 7 and uh, it's great to have that meal first but you'll need to get reservations uh, uh, some days in advance uh, so that they can get a discount on the meal and taking care of all those particulars. But uh, I just want to say uh, that the views and opinions expressed by myself are not necessarily those of the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship. Neither are there Marks. You know, Mark has to see this broadcast and he has to prove uh, this broadcast, uh, what I've been sharing. Otherwise, it's not going to get seen by anybody other than himself. Uh, we have checks and balances before these go out into the public access airways. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to... Uh, um, have a chance to share some of the things that I shared with you. Uh, uh, I, I just really see some good things yet before the return of the Lord. God is just going to uproot a, a whole bunch of uh, sacred cows in Christianity. I, there was a guy said something to me that was as profound as anything that I've ever heard, and this this will just just this will cause some people to shut this TV off immediately at this point. He said, "You know, if you remove the money motive in Christianity, it would have so much more effect upon humanity. Just remove the money motive. Then you'd see who's doing what for what reasons." And you know, I've thought about that, and he's absolutely right. Remove the money motive from Christianity, and we would all be amazed what would happen overnight. We'd see who would be doing it for what reasons, wouldn't we? Now, is that to lay a guilt trip? You know, you've heard it said, well, we have to have money to do ministry. Well, as, as ministries are, yeah, I have to agree with that, but I don't agree with that totally. We don't need one dime to perpetuate the gospel of Jesus Christ, really. You know, you could shut down every church in America. You could shut down every church on planet Earth. With the current uh, literature available, with the current knowledge of Christianity, if every Christian did nothing more than go down house to house on their block saying, I'd like to share the good news of the gospel with you, uh, are you interested in hearing it? No thanks, bam, door gets slammed in your face, okay, praise God, go to the next house, knock on the door. If every Christian went down their block availing themselves to simply be used of God to share the good news of the gospel, tell people what it is if they've never heard it, 
avail himself? Can I pray for you? Can I help you in any way? Come with some unconditional love. That wouldn't cost one penny. We could all do that. And there's enough Christians in America to go into every street, every house, every human being to do basically what we've been called to do. Share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everything else is secondary. Yeah, we're all be making disciples, but we can do that without money. We really could if we had to. It won't happen that way. We know that, but it could. So, you know, there's two sides to this money issue. You go into the, you go, you, you hear, uh, whether it be TV ministries or you go to the local church and the offering plate comes down and, you know, there's different presentations to that, but there are many, many local churches who are beginning to realize there's some uh, bona fide um, uh, concern about this objection is that all the church wants is your money. And, and it's so easy to get caught up in this trap thinking, well, i got to pay bills and we got to meet salary and expenses and all of that. And that is a great burden for pastors and people in ministry to, to be a part of. But, but remember that we can get so focused on the needs, financial needs, that we're coming across as though all we want is people's money. And that's dangerous because we give place to the devil. We should tell people, no, we don't want your money. God wants your soul. He wants you to be saved. He don't need your money. If you think we need your money, please don't ever give to this ministry. Give to some other ministry. We don't want to be guilty of being accused of wanting your money. Okay, that would be the first thing that we ought to probably be doing. The second thing, church full of hypocrites, well, I'll tell you something got some bad news. You know, hell is full of hypocrites. Hell is full of hypocrites. Why so? Well, there's going to be a lot of people going to hell saying, man, I didn't know hell was real. I didn't know God was serious about keeping me out of heaven for eternity. Wow. I wish I'd have listened while I was on planet Earth. I, I've, I got all wound up and I lost track of time, so we're going to have to stop right in my train of thought just want to share a couple of things as we bring this broadcast to a, a close. Um, perhaps you would like a, a copy of this broadcast. Uh, maybe there's someone you'd like to get a copy to or you just like to get one for your own purposes. Uh, some of the public access stations that uh, show these broadcasts offer copies. You can contact your local public access station, uh, obtain a copy from them. Some do, some don't. Otherwise, uh, we offer copies of these broadcasts, so both an audio cassette tape as well as uh, videotape. Uh, you can contact us uh, if you would like a copy. Uh, we don't charge for these tapes, although we do reserve the right uh, to limit or delay requests should it become necessary to do so. Uh, the ordering information is coming up shortly, so get something to write with and take down that information if you want to. Uh, inquire or simply get a copy. I also want to thank the public access stations for airing uh, these broadcasts. Without them, it would not be possible for us to bring these into the privacy of people's homes. With that, I just want to say again that the views and opinions expressed on this broadcast are certainly not those of the Full Gospel Businessmen's Association or any local church or ministry. They're solely my own. And as Mark shared, he assumed...